Yo, MJ, your tire is flat. What you talking about, man? Bro, are you going to pull over? What you mean I got a flat? Do you have a spare? Bro, I don't have a father. Bro, where is your spare? I told you, I don't know where my father is. You can't just ignore it. Why not? Man, if you ignore it, guess what? You can have a blowout or an ultimate wreck. Bro, I've been riding like this all this time and I've been just fine. I ain't getting ready to stop. All right, bro. But don't forget what will happen to your passengers. You can cause permanent damage to them if you don't fix that thing. Bro, those are my kids back there. All right, man, I'll pull over. I'm all right is what I said, but I'm a wreck is how I felt. As I coasted through life quietly on a flat without a spare. The responsibility of being a man is enormous and the pressure of being a boy without a father is just as weighty. Mothers are generally seen as essential parents, while fathers, on the other hand, are often viewed as optional. But the reality is the presence of a father is vital to the development of children. Father absence can be detrimental to the development of healthy identity. Emotionally unhealthy boys become unhealthy men and fathers who often enter into unhealthy relationships and marriages and if they are not healed produce unhealthy sons who in many cases are left to figure out how to become a man on their own. According to our cultural and societal context, boys are held to a high expectation of low to no emotional expression. The biblical account of Noah's sons after seeing him drunk and naked indicate an age-old expectation for men and boys to not say what they see and don't acknowledge how what you saw made you feel. We are told as boys to suck it up, be a big boy, because big boys don't cry. And if you cry, you're going to get a reason to cry, as if being born into circumstances of disadvantage isn't reason enough to cry. We are expected to be loud but silent at the same time, a term that I've coined as noisy silence. We're expected as boys and men to be loud on the basketball court, the football field, in the stands, on the playground, and those of us who are in ministry in the pulpit. And yes, definitely we are expected to be a loud fusion of Mandingo and Tarzan in the bedroom. We've been trained, if not by our instructors, but by our secret pain to only allow ourselves to express reactions to external stimuli, but to refrain from communicating the sentiments of our heart and internal emotional experience. Girls get to play with dump trucks and sandboxes and cars and get a pass as being 
a town boy. But if a boy picks up a baby doll or cuddles with a stuffy, he is beat without ceasing. And he is labeled a sissy or a punk. Brothers, I was in the room when my wife gave birth to both of my children. And if you have seen it, I believe that you will agree with me. We really don't want to be the mommy. But we would like to at least play the role of an affectionate daddy. Although a boy doesn't have the testosterone of a full-grown man, he is expected to put bass in his voice in order to be masculine. We are the sons of women who have been abandoned by our fathers. We're the husbands of women who expect us to live up to the standard of their fathers or to be the constant presence that makes the difference for the void left by their daddy that was never there. As men of African descent in America, we have been fighting for our identity and masculinity since the days of slavery. And to my sisters, I know that there may be some mistrust and disappointment and even anger because we left you uncovered, open and vulnerable, And my sisters, I am sorry. Please know that when you called us, we tried to answer. But our neck was under knee and foot. And nooses were around our neck. We couldn't breathe. And shamefully, we admit, that when you were being beaten and raped, we were too. All of this pressure, though not intentional, leads to silence that I call the silence of the man. Adam, the first man, was created to be a communicator. He was created to be a companion. That's what the biblical text tells us. But fear of exposure drove him into hiding. Because as men, we don't like being vulnerable. So we often hide and cover. For many men, silence is a means of protection. That was my coping mechanism. If I don't speak, they won't know. If they don't know, they cannot judge me. And if they don't judge me, they won't hurt me. But the truth of the matter is, brothers, that if you keep it in without letting it out, you won't need them to hurt you because you'll begin to deteriorate and decay from within. Or While riding on a flat, you will destroy the whole rim. The internal noise produced by external silence creates emotional sabotage. I say that it is to crucify one's truth to nurture a fantasy. Because as I've written in my book, Made in His Image, but His Shadow is All I've Seen, sometimes your reality is not as pretty as your fantasy. Ask me. How do I know? Around eight years ago, after driving on a flat for 35 years, I ended up in a major cross section of life where I was left with the urgency of making a decision to either address my flat or end up in a life-threatening collision that wouldn't just affect me but my passengers as well. You see, one of the most impactful experiences in my life that affected my whole entire life was the absence of my father. 
by virtue of abandonment and neglect. My father left me before my newborn eyes could behold his face. His financial contribution wasn't my greatest deficit, and I know that many people have suffered the lack of financial contribution from one of their parents. But the greatest deficit that I was left with was not finances. Because child support that I never got would have been for my mother. But emotional support is for the child. And without my father's presence, my identity lingered in the balance between am I this or am I that? Because it was his job to tell me who I was and to shape my identity. I felt inferior, less than, guilty, ashamed, responsible, unwanted. Why did my father not want me? And who was I supposed to be because I carried his DNA, but I had never seen his face. And because I had never seen his face, I really didn't know how to embrace my own face. Oftentimes, because my father had come to this country from the continent of Africa, I would run into other individuals from Africa in restaurants and stores, and they would look at me and ask me, where are you from? And I'd say, I'm from New York. They'd say, no, where are you really from? I'd say, well, I went to school in Atlanta. They'd say, where are you really from? I live in Milwaukee. No, where are you from? I recognize you. I know that you are an Igbo man. But because I had never seen my father, I did not know what they saw in me because when he left me, he took a portion of my self-identity. All of these feelings were internal without an outlet because I was riding with the windows up to avoid the sound of my truth. I thought that acting as if I was okay was a part of being a man because big boys don't cry. I acted like I was okay. It didn't bother me. I'm good. I don't need him. My tire is all right. I'll survive. I'll make it. I've been doing all right all these years by myself. I'm good. Hmm. But the truth of the matter is that I really wasn't good. I really wasn't okay. Until I learned that what you don't deal with will eventually deal with you. It wasn't until I became a father and was responsible for giving from a deficit that I realized that I needed to pull over and address my flat because I didn't want to damage my children as a result of my lack of resolve due to the pain of my father's absence in my life. At the same time that I became a new father, I was working in the prison as a chaplain where I worked with thousands of men who needed my guidance and spiritual care. Though I had never been incarcerated or convicted of a crime, after each counseling session, I realized just how much I was related to the individuals that I counseled. Many of them, as they sat in my office, I asked them one single question, and 90 percent of the men that sat in my office, I asked them after hearing their story about how their life took many twists and turns and wound them up, ending them in prison, where was your daddy? And 
most of them said to me, Chaplain, I did not know my father. He was not there for me. Or in some cases, he is my cellmate. Wow. The pain of fatherlessness can lead to a life of imprisonment. If not behind physical bars. It can trap you in your mind behind the bars of silence. But for me, if I was going to be a good daddy, husband, counselor, mentor, I had to first heal. I have not been on an airplane much during this pandemic, but I remember pre-pandemic days of flying many times throughout the course of a month. One of the things that I remember hearing the pilots say often every time when I would board a plane is in the unlikely event of a loss of pressure in the cabin, there will be an oxygen mask deployed from the overhead compartment. And if you happen to be sitting next to someone who needs assistance, put the mask on yourself first and then help them. If I was going to be a good daddy, husband, counselor, mentor, friend, I had to first deal with my own pain. For me, I thought out of sight, out of mind. If my dad wasn't there, it wouldn't bother me. I wanted to give that impression, but the truth of the matter is that my father was always out of sight, but he was always on my mind. What did I have to do? I had to learn to grieve the loss of my expectations. I had to accept the fact that what I wanted, I did not have. But it did not mean that I could not have something that was just as good or valuable to me to assist me in making it to the place that I was destined to be. I had to learn how to forgive my father, a person who never said sorry. Because forgiveness was not about him. Forgiveness was about me allowing my future and my present to exist independent of the past. I had to learn how to reconcile between the boy and the man so that I would not repeat or that I would not inflict upon my children what had been inflicted upon me. Because, you know, sometimes we as adults say, well, I didn't have it, so you have to experience the same lack that I experienced. So I had a conversation with the boy in me that was abandoned, neglected, and rejected by his father. And I spoke to the boy in me. I said, I am sorry for what you experienced. I'm sorry that your dad left you. I'm sorry that your father rejected you and that he did not want you. But this is not your moment. Your moment has expired, but this is the moment for the adult man that is healed and that has matured and that has grown beyond the point of his pain and is able to now give from a place of healing as opposed to a place from a place of pain. I gave myself permission to heal. About three years ago, I received a message from the Reverend Dr. Claudette Copeland, my auntie. She said to me, Micaiah, we've got a healing retreat going on. She sent me the advertisement and I was able to read the details about the retreat and I said, Absolutely. Thank you for sharing this information with me. I am going to pass it along to my mother because I'm sure that she will want to be at this retreat. But Dr. Copeland said to me, no, nephew, this is for you. I was stunned by the fact that she identified my flat and provided a space for me as a man to pull over 
and to take time to address it and to continue my journey towards healing. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of the healing retreat. My brothers, whether you were born with a flat or got punctured along the way, you deserve a smooth ride. Riding on a flat can be embarrassing because we think that people are looking at us. But brothers, the truth of the matter is that we've all been there before. But you'll never get better until you pull over and first assess the situation. Ask yourself, what happened? What is the condition of the tire? What damage was done, if any, to the rim? Are you riding on a flat because you've been looking for a spare in the wrong space? Hmm. I invite you, brothers, to pull over for a moment. Use your voice. In whichever pitch comes naturally, break the silence and tell your lifelong oppressors to get your foot off my neck. I can't breathe let alone talk. Don't wait on society to liberate you or your subculture to free you. Give yourself permission to feel, express, speak, and most of all, to heal. You deserve it because that, brothers, is the manly thing to do. What Adam lacked was the understanding of relationship. God knew that for healing to take place, Adam, the first man, had to become a son. Adam was made in God's image, but he didn't know who he was until he met God as father and identified as a son. He needed to see himself in his father. Yes, my brothers and my sisters, I know that God is a mother to the motherless, a friend to the friendless, but boys without a daddy need to know him as a father to the fatherless. God sent a man in human form to restore humankind to himself. He could have sent him as his brother, his nephew, his cousin, his friend, but rather he sent him as a son, calling him the firstborn of many brothers. Jesus, also known as the second Adam, came to tell me, Micaiah, if your daddy doesn't want you, I'll share my daddy with you. Although my father rejected me, God claimed me and accepted me. And I found my healing in identifying with God as father and accepting my position as a son. My tire was flat. I did not have a spare because my tire was a run flat. They were built to keep going until I could make it back to the manufacturer. To be patched, inflated, and restored. I asked God, why did he allow my father to abandon and leave me? And he spoke to me and he said, Micaiah, your father did not qualify. Had he raised you, his imprint would be on you. But I allowed a separation so that I could raise you even by way of your pain. 
and I could put my hand on you and put my character within you and make you my representative in the earth. And so when he rejected you, I claimed you and I made you a son. And so today, every now and then, I have to pull over and visit the We Are Healing Retreat to get my tires inflated when they get a little low. But I know who I am. I am a son. Brothers, let's ride on well-inflated tires. Take care of you. I'm a son. You may not know me. I'm a son. I'm a son. And even if you don't claim me, you may not claim me. I'm still a son. But I'm a son. God gave me an inheritance. I have an inheritance. 